I, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I want to uh, just share with you some of the uh, latest findings we have on the broad topic of human capital analytics. And I'm going to go through uh, a, a couple different studies that we have done, as well as one unpublished study we just completed the research on. So you're getting the, uh, the very first preview to some of the research. Um, let me first just give you a quick background on, on my organization and what we do. Uh, I4CP, you can say C3PO, it's, uh, I know it's kind of a weird acronym, uh, stands for the Institute for Corporate Productivity. And we're a research organization that does really one thing. We research the people practices of high-performing organizations. And that term is important, so I want to define it for you because I'm going to use it a lot. When I say a high-performing organization, or HPO, what I mean are companies that have better revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction in the last five years over their competition. And so when we go research companies, we're looking at those high-performing organizations and contrasting it from low performers and seeing are there any differences in the way they manage their people. And 99 times out of 100, there are great differences in how they manage their people. Uh, so a couple of reports that I'll reference here. One is called HR Analytics, Why We're Not There Yet. Uh, another one is uh, a more recent report called The Age of Big Data that we just published, um, as well as a couple other uh, little reports that I'll throw in here. So a quick question. How many of you uh, have seen or heard of the movie or book Moneyball? You'll be very happy that this is going to be a Moneyball-less presentation. I'm not going to reference it whatsoever. Uh, it's way overdone. And it seems like every analytics presentation I go to, they talk about Moneyball. So that's the only time I'll talk about Moneyball. Um, what I will do, though, is show you some real-life quotes from real people uh, that are in HR. And I, I work with a number of chief human resource officers, as well as CLOs and, and heads of talent. And I want to uh, highlight some of their comments and some of their thoughts on analytics. And one of my favorite was actually uh, a, a, just a conversation I was having with Charlie Piscatello. Charlie's the head of uh, HR at Petco, great guy. And he said this to me in a phone call one day. He said, Kevin, here's what's wrong with HR. If you look at every other function that sits around that executive table with the CEO, they've all done a great job at using data. And you can think about marketing, for instance, you know, that uh, has just done a wonderful job using data to talk about what they're doing. He said, in HR, we have not done that, and that's a big issue. We have not used data to our benefit, and he's trying to change that at Petco, and a number of uh, organizations, obviously, are trying to change that. And one of the reasons they're trying to change that, here's, here's a uh, stat from our most recent report. To what extent are analytics in your business important? You can see high-performing organizations, by 18% more than low-performing organizations, are saying today it's important, and in five years, it's going to be even more important. In fact, when we ask those same organizations, why are you collecting this data? Strategic planning was the number one answer by a factor of two to one over low-performing organizations, which I thought was remarkable. This was one of the biggest differences we had in the report between high and low-performing organizations around why they're collecting data. And it's really all about successful companies wanting to, to be a company that anticipates and prepares. It's not one that's using data to react to daily problems. And we see this over and over again as we interview these companies that are using data effectively. They're really using it for strategic workforce planning or anything that's going to help them in the future uh, from a planning perspective. Now, saying that, we still have a long way to go. This same report said only a quarter of the participants uh, in the study indicated that their organizations are equipped to meet today's analytical needs. How many of you think your organization is equipped to meet the analytics needs of, of the company? Come on, I need about a quarter of the hands to raise up. Uh, Paul Humphreys is the head of HR at Flextronics. Um, Flextronics is a very forward-looking organization. Uh, they did something that I had, have said to a few companies over the years uh, should be done. When Workday was just starting out, uh, rather than adopt Workday as, and be an early adopter of their technology, they invested in Workday. And they made a fortune investing in Workday, uh, sitting on the board. And uh, Paul was uh, very much behind that decision uh, and involved in that decision to do so. Uh, 
he had a nice quote in a study we did a little while ago called The Future of HR, where he says, there are multiple ways to look at people costs and think how to impact financial and operating outcomes. Identifying the data you need to make that impact will direct your metric strategy. And when you think about strategy, it's all about how do we tie this to bottom line business results? When we ask companies, can you do that? Low performers are, by a factor of two to one, more apt to say no. We can't tie HR to business results right now in our organization versus high performers. Don is the head of uh, HR at Adobe. And she talked about this and took it a step further, talking about the role of the business partner as someone who can work at that strategic level and diagnosing what the people needs are for the respective businesses. And I think that's really the key. I, I had lunch with uh, someone I won't name uh, who is a business person who has gone into the role of CLO inside his organization. And he was describing to me that that gives him much, much greater insight uh, to how he can help the learning organization meet the needs of the business. And we see this over and over again as, an, as top organizations look at what are they doing with HR, what are they doing with learning or other HR functions. Moving from a business partner to a performance advisor and really helping those functions understand how to be more competitive versus being an order taker is what it's all about. And analytics give them the tools they need to, uh, to be that effective business partner. We, um, how many of you know uh, John Boudreau and Ed Lawler at uh, USC, so Center for Effective Organizations? Great, great organization. We, um, and we do a bunch of research together uh, with them. We did a recent study on looking at the perceptions of HR versus businesses' perception of HR, which I, I always think is an interesting thing to take a look at. And this is a longitudinal study that we've done over several years. And you can see from the chart how HR views itself five to seven years ago versus today. They view, in the past, they used to do a lot more maintaining of records uh, or just being an HR service provider. Today, they feel like they're much more of a strategic business partner to the organization. Well, that's great. Let's see how the business people perceive HR. There's not a whole lot of difference, actually. It's a little bit up on the strategic business partner. And my next slide will compare the two. But you can see is, it's a fairly significant difference between how non-HR people view HR as a strategic business partner versus how HR views itself overall. And so it's, a, it's kind of a nagging perception problem that we have out in the industry. And one of the reasons why I think we have this, uh, Skip is the head of HR at TIA CREF. He, um, he very succinctly says, the HR function provides a lot of data, but not a lot of information. And essentially what he's saying is, you've got to tell the story. How do you turn that data into a story that matters to the business function? In fact, when we survey companies and ask, what is the most concerning problem to you around analytics? It's the ability to make use of the data and turning that into information over a number of other issues that they're most concerned about. And this art of storytelling is one that I'm now hearing a number of organizations begin to say, we're hiring for that. We're looking for data uh, analysis. We're looking for people who have that skill set to be able to tell the story. What is that data telling you overall? Now, as part of this uh, more recent study that we did on big data, we asked a number of questions around enablers and inhibitors. And one of, the, uh, one of the biggest differences here on the inhibitor side, you can see it's more than 2x, was around leadership. Where high-performing organizations, they generally feel leadership is an enabler when it comes to data analytics and big data overall where low-performing organizations are much more apt to say that leadership is an inhibitor to them being able to do this effectively. Now, that is, uh, that's something that came across loud and clear when we really examined what are the traits of an analytical company. And if you think about your organization, if you, if you answer a simple question, is the company you work for today an analytical company or not? And if they are, I'm willing to bet that you find amongst your leadership, there's pretty good analytical ability 
in leadership? And if you, ask the if you answer the question, no, we're not that, I'm willing to bet that your leaders really are not analytical people and don't use data to a great extent. In fact, it extends even beyond that. We found through the study that there's analytical capability in many different functions across the organization, not just the obvious ones like finance or R&D, but when you go into marketing or you go into other areas that maybe you know, have not traditionally been very data heavy, they have a very analytical mindset in analytical organizations. These same companies are looking very actively right now to increase their analytical capabilities. They're hiring for it and they're training for it. In fact, if you go out and Google some of the you know, job openings right now for uh, data analysts, it's, it's crazy how many companies right now are looking for data analysts inside their organization so that it can take, they can take advantage of this trend around big data. And using big data to help with human capital decisions is something that we found high performing organizations are absolutely doing, especially ones that think they're analytical companies. Now we had, we had everybody uh, that took this study rate and rank the analytical capability of different departments. And I'm only showing you a few departments here. But you can see between R&D, the executive team, finance, and HR, we asked, are the data capabilities non-existent, poor, basic, advanced, or expert? Now, the high performers were obviously much more likely to say that for R&D, for the executive team, that they're advanced or expert, much more so than low performing organizations. But look at HR. The numbers are pretty low overall on HR. High performers are, are, are gonna say we have analytical capabilities in HR more than low performers. It's still pretty low compared to some of those other functions. And if I showed you, we have marketing, it didn't all fit in the slide, but we have a number of other departments. It's the same, HR is pretty low overall. Now the good news is those top companies feel like they've got it inside their organization. And if they don't have it, have it, we ask them, what are you doing to meet those analytical needs? So do you have the capabilities today? No, we plan on mostly training current staff to reach the needed analytical capabilities was the number one answer. But then you can see that hiring is also uh, up there at 17% as well, hiring for analytical capabilities. Now, a big question, I just talked about somebody who came from business and went into HR. A big question is, do we get these skill sets from within the human capital function? Or do we have to take folks from the business side and bring them in and teach them HR? So everybody in this room has some connection to human capital for the most part. How many of you got into this because you were a whiz at statistics and financial analysis and that was your forte when you were in school? Raise your hand. We got a, we got a few, that's good. I know, Lori, you, I would expect you to raise your hand. I've done this, I've asked that question to SHRM audiences. I think I asked that question last year at this. Um, you know, people don't get into HR because they are great financial analysts. You know, or they're off the charts in, in statistics. That's not why they got into HR. They got into HR because they're people people, right? That's generally what you hear from folks when you ask them, why'd you get into this? So it's a skills gap that we have in this, in this uh, industry that I think we have to quickly change. If, we're, if we go back to you know, what Charlie was talking about or Paul was talking about at the beginning and become more like those other functions that sit around the executive table. Now, a big part of becoming more like those functions is reporting. And we, um, we've asked a number of companies around people reporting and what kind of people metrics you are reporting on and just the act of reporting. How often are you doing it? So when we asked who's responsible for calculating workforce results, 22% said HR analytics, 21% said the head of HR, 11% said it's within the business. We got a bunch of other different answers that aren't on there. There was no statistical difference when we looked at high performers versus low performers here or when we looked at just effectiveness around HR, there was no statistical difference between who was actually doing the reporting. When we asked what systems are you using to calculate those results, 
whether it's HRIS, a talent management system, again, no difference in what you are using to actually calculate the results, unless it was just spreadsheets or a raw database. Then we did see that that was not correlated to market performance. When we asked how often are workforce results produced, whether it's monthly, quarterly, again, doesn't matter. No statistical difference between high and low performers. What matters is who's getting those reports. And if the executive team and the CEO are getting those people metrics on a monthly or quarterly basis, that had a statistical correlation to overall market performance. In general, those companies were better market performers than those that weren't using and getting these workforce reports. And that's, that's a critical learning, I think, is, is I've looked at our studies around analytics and around workforce reporting, making sure that the senior team has a dashboard and even just a lever that they can pull to help make change inside the organization is critical. And I'll talk about what you should report on in a second and how many metrics you should measure, but the fact that the executive team and CEO are getting those reports is something that top companies are doing on a regular basis. And really, measurement matters. You can see here that these are all uh, about two to one or even more um, where high performers are doing this more than low performer, performing organizations, where senior levels of management are regularly reviewing HR metrics, where they're employing human capital analytics to help answer specific business questions, where HR metrics are being used for strategic business planning purposes, and where they're integrating human capital metrics with business metrics to demonstrate the effectiveness or the effective alignment between HR functions and the strategies of the company. All of those were off the chart differences between top companies and bottom companies from a revenue perspective, profitability perspective, market share perspective, et cetera. Now, the, when we asked how many different metrics are you measuring, it was interesting that less was actually less. So low performing organizations actually measure just a few things, where high performing companies tend to measure more things overall. And you can see the 20 plus, you know, that was a two to one difference. Um, the 15 to 20 low performers didn't even show up in that particular one. So it's the more metrics that, uh, that are being measured, uh, these companies feel like you know, it's giving them better insight. However, I would say that when you're reporting to senior management, you can't throw a whole bunch of metrics at senior management. And I've seen this many, many times where it really turns off uh, an executive team to have to sift through lots and lots and lots of core metrics. And so I've advised many CHROs and others in the, in the analytics uh, position really winnow it down to what's important. You can have all that other data, and when you get asked questions, you've got it. But just make sure from a reporting standpoint, you are uh, making that uh, concise. Now, here are some things that people are measuring. So when we ask which metrics uh, are, are you reporting on, performance and potential ratings. In fact, the, the bottom one, time to fill, train, and onboard, those were the two that had the biggest gaps between high performers and low performers. But things like training completed, turnover rates, headcount, and I'll go into a few of these in, in greater detail in a second. Those are all things that people are measuring on today. And you can see the biggest gaps between top companies and low-performing low companies. Now, all of that is better information than what we typically have done in HR over the years. I'm a big Dilbert fan, and here's a pointy hair boss doing an exit interview with a guy who just quit. And he said, what would you say is your main reason for leaving? I can't stand working for an unethical weasel. So point to your boss is back with the head of HR and said, yep, he's got personal problems. And uh, the head of HR says, I'm glad that we collect this helpful data. We too often rely on sketchy data, right, and anecdotal data inside of organizations. The exit interview is a great example of that, uh, as opposed to what top companies are really doing today, and that's getting deep into the data around things that we call quality metrics. And so I want to show you four critical quality metrics. Uh, I, I ran through some of these last year uh, at, this, uh, at the conference that over and over again, we're seeing top companies put a lot of time and effort into. So 
I'll preface what these are. The first one is quality of hire. Is your organization acquiring better talent? The second one is time to full productivity. How long does it take someone to become fully productive? The third, which might even be the most important out of all this, is quality of movement. So when talent is moving in your organization, how is that happening? What's happening? And is it moving in your organization? And the fourth, uh, which we probably spend the most time on in, in discussing, is quality of attrition. Are you losing valuable talent? Why are you losing that valuable talent? Where are you losing that valuable talent? So let's take each of these separately and talk about quality of hire. Now, how many of you are tracking hiring cycle time in your organization? Let me see a show of hands. All right, congratulations. You're just like all low-performing companies out in, in the world. You're tracking hiring cycle time. If you take a look, I've showed you a lot of graphs so far that the high performers are always above the low performers. On this particular graph, with one small exception, the low performers outpace the high performers. And they're outpacing them on very tactical stuff. So hiring cycle time, cost to fill, acceptance rate of first offers. I think, personally, I think hiring cycle time is one of the dumbest metrics we track overall. I didn't expect to get applause for that one, but that's great. Because you think about it, you know, I, I realize there's call centers and you got to have, you know, butts and seats in certain, in certain jobs. But when you're tracking hiring cycle time and that becomes a big uh, metric that you're looking at, clearly you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're making mistakes, right? The, the onus is on how quickly we can hire somebody, not hiring the best talent. High performers are looking at much deeper things and better things. They're looking at things like what is the employee referral rate in our organization, even the employer referral rate by specific segment. What is the cycle time to competency or full productivity once we bring somebody on board? This is, gets very tied to attrition. When we hire somebody, what is their term of service? How long do they stay with us? What happens to those individuals? Do we promote them uh, long term? Are they moving inside the organization? Are they st staying with us for a lengthy period of time? All of those are factors in, uh, in measuring the quality of hire. And it's important to make sure that that metric is shared both by talent acquisition, by the recruiters, as well as the hiring managers. Because there's often, when it doesn't work out, there's a lot of finger pointing that happens in, in that situation. So really looking at hiring cycle time, I think, is a, is a great quality metric. There's a big gap between companies who think we should be doing this going forward, but we don't really do it today. Only about 16% of companies that we survey said, yeah, we are measuring quality of hire to a great degree, but most of them say we should be doing this going forward. How many of you think you're doing quality of hire and measuring that? Or do you know? Okay, I got like two hands on that one. All right, so that's, that's something to take a look at when you go back to uh, your organization and ask some of these questions. Quality of hire is, it can be a little subjective. You know, there's not a real clear measuring stick. So you've got to be clear on what are we measuring and how do we feel about it. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those metrics that's probably best if it's, um, you know, looking at things like longer tenure, promotability, increased productivity, the manager satisfaction. In fact, I love this question. Go to your manager someday and do a blind survey with them and say, of your current group, how many of those individuals would you hire again now knowing what you know? And uh, you know, I, can, I can tell you, in my career, there's a lot of times where you know, that number was not as high as I'd like it to be. So these are some of the things that you can look at for quality of hire. But the best benchmark is probably against yourself. Because when you try to benchmark this versus other organizations, there's so much variability on what do we mean by quality of hire that it's better to look internally around this and look across similar business units, look over time, look by hiring manager, and look for who's doing it right, who's, who's not, what do we need to fix. Now, we have a, a scorecard. At the end, I'll have a little link where you can download these scorecards if you want. But we have Excel-based scorecards that help uh, organizations with all of these quality metrics. And so here's some of the output on quality of hire, just some sample screenshots so you can see 
you know, how you can look at this particular metric. You know, the first 90 days, you know, the, the retention over, you know, one to two year period, et cetera. The next quality metric is time to full productivity. And this is a very interesting one because again, it really kind of depends on your definition. And I think your definition depends on what kind of business you are. So there are really three ways that we think about time to full productivity. One is pretty basic. It's just the time it takes before a new employee has all of the, the right credentials and equipment to perform their job, right? Which is basically onboarding. How long does it take to get somebody into a role where they can perform their job? The second is the time it takes for that employee to master their skills at full capacity. How long does it take us to get that person up to full capacity so that they're working the way we expect them to work? And then the third way to look at this is how long does it take someone to become a master at their craft or at their role? You know, someone with maybe two to three years experience, maybe it's more depending on the type of company you have and the type of job it is. But those are three ways to look at time to full productivity. And the important thing is to settle on how you want to measure that. And you may measure it differently for different roles within your organization. Because becoming a master in a, in a certain role might not be as critical as just making sure that somebody is up to speed and can perform the job. Again, we have some uh, scorecards that help with time to full productivity and, and looking at you know, what, what is the percent variance by, you know, by, by position, by manager, and how long it takes people to become fully productive. There's a little bit of subjectivity, of course, in this one versus some of the others, because manager input, I think, plays a big role there. Now, I already said quality of movement might be the most important. And this is, every time we go out and survey high-performing organizations and look at some of these quality metrics, this is a metric that top companies uh, really seem to gravitate towards, and low-performing companies seem to not care about whatsoever. And let me give you an example of why. So, in any company, and I'm sure you can think of people like this right now, there are going to be managers that hoard talent. They're hoarding talent because that talent is power. And the, the talent they have in their division, their group, their business unit is making them successful. Hoarding talent is a horrible thing to do. Because if you've got that talented person inside your organization, that's the lifeblood of the company. It's probably a high potential. It's somebody that's uh, you know, going to be a future star in the organization. But if they're buried in a particular department or division, and not experiencing the rest of the organization, they're never going to reach their potential. And so quality of movement is tracking that. And it's also rewarding it. You know, by tracking quality of movement, you then can reward managers who do a great job of not hoarding talent. And the top companies I see or that, that look at this, they almost treat it as an ethical violation. If you're hoarding talent, that's against the ethics of the company. Um, Quality of movement looks at things like internal placement rate, or promotion rates, or movement rates, or retention uh, after a promotion. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of measure how are people moving inside the organization. High potentials, and this has been reported many, many times, one of the biggest reasons high potentials quit an organization is because they feel like they are not valued and not being developed inside the company. And unless they feel like, I'm part of the strategy of the organization, I'm, I'm being developed, I'm seeing broad aspects of the organization, they're going to leave. And they're the most apt to leave because they're high potentials. And they've got great skill sets. And that's the most expensive attrition you can have, is to have your high potentials walk out the door. Not year one employees. That's, that's expensive as well. It's the high potentials inside the company. And so quality of movement is another scorecard we have that uh, you can download and take a look at. Uh, how people are tracking that movement inside the organization. Now, the last one is attrition. Uh, and there's a lot of different terms uh, for attrition. Uh, we, can, we can call it termination, turnover, separation. It's a lot of different uh, words that people use to essentially mean the same thing. But quality of attrition is a very interesting one. When we study this and look at the difference between high and low performers, I'm going to bet that most of you in, in your organizations are tracking voluntary termination, involuntary termination, overall attrition, 
And I'll tell you right now, it doesn't matter whether you're tracking that or not. That's just kind of table stakes. High performing companies do that. Low performing companies do that. They track that. The difference is low performing companies stop there. They don't go any further. Where high performing companies begin to look at things like, what are the termination rates of our first year employees? What are the termination rates by different variables? The grade of the employees, costs, demographics. What are the high potentials or critical, pivotal jobs? Uh, what's happening there? Are we losing people in those roles? Where are we losing them? At what point in the year are we losing them? What are the reasons we're losing them? Where are they going when we lose them? In fact, one of, the most, one of our member organizations uh, did an interesting thing. Instead of just relying on the exit interview uh, at the moment of termination or you know, the moment that person decides they're going to leave, they were calling people that left the company uh, a year later, six months to a year later, and saying, hey, I just want to talk to you about you know, your decision to leave our organization and want to ask you a few questions. They found they were getting back about 20% of those people. Those people, the grass was not greener, right? And so those people said, hey, look, you know, I, I probably made a mistake. I shouldn't have left. I would love to come back. And that was a, that was a great recruiting mechanism for those companies to, uh, to be you know, talking to those people that had left, because a lot of them did not make the right decision. So quality of attrition is another metric that I think is very tied to quality of hire. Those two can be very linked together when you're looking at that quality of hire. But again, another scorecard that you can take a look at. Um, <laughs> that's Jeffrey jumping up and down. And, um, somewhat tied to this is the notion of talent mapping. And so I've talked a lot about high potentials or critical and pivotal uh, roles inside an organization. You can, those are all, all can be kind of different things. Uh, somebody who's in a pivotal job or in a critical role doesn't necessarily have to be a high potential, but if they're going to leave the organization, it's going to cause you pain as an organization. And so understanding who's in a critical or a pivotal job is, uh, is important for a company. And so we, um, we've worked with a few different companies that will do a talent map, uh, like I've got up here, where the bottom axis is how core are they to the business success. And on the, uh, the other axis is what is the uh, difficulty to acquire these skills in the market? And this is a great exercise to have. In fact, there's uh, some boards of directors I know that are beginning to look at talent risk just like they look at financial risk. And they're asking some pretty tough questions of the organization around, hey, if, what are our talent risks from our current employees? What's our talent risk going forward, our ability to acquire talent, particularly in certain regions? I've talked to a few companies who bet big on India and you know, now are thinking that's probably not the place we want to continue to bet big on. They're looking at their talent risk in certain geographies. And so your ability to map this out on a grid like this um, helps really pinpoint where you need to focus. And this is an actual talent map from an insurance company that you can see the upper right-hand quadrant has things like product development, strategic management, distributor services, our uh, strategic finance, direct sales. Those are all in you know, strategic HR made that upper right-hand quadrant. But look in the, the left-hand bottom quadrant where tactical HR is. You know, tactical HR really not core to the business success and not that hard to acquire those skills in the marketplace. Same with financial transactions. Uh, sales support was another one that was in that bottom quadrant. Really understanding where those roles fall from a talent map perspective uh, will help as you do some of this data analysis. Now, I mentioned I wanted to show you a report that we have yet to release. We, um, we do most of ASTD's research. Uh, and ASTD is doing four to five big research projects each year in the learning field. And we recently just did a report on the use of big data in organizational learning. Uh, so we've got the stats back, but the report hasn't been written. Uh, probably be published, I would say, within about six weeks or so. But I want to show you some of the statistics, because I know we've got a lot of learning professionals here that I think would be uh, interested in what this shows around big data. Uh, so we completed the survey in January and February. Um, a total of 418 respondents uh, participated in it. And one of the questions we asked was, what is the amount of data you have today 
versus five years from now? Is it much more, moderately more, slightly more, or the same? And you can see that from today or one, you know, one year, today versus one year ago, uh, that people said it's slightly, it's slightly more uh, overall. But five, you know, versus five years ago, it, it's much more, the amount of data that people have today. And they're struggling with that. They've got a lot of data at their fingertips. But the ability to use that smartly, to tell that story, like I said before, is where I think a lot of folks are struggling. So we asked, are you leveraging big data for learning? And 22% said, yes, we are currently leveraging big data for learning. Another 20% said no, but we plan to within the next 12 months. Uh, another 18, 19% said no, but we plan to outside of the next uh, 12 months. And then the largest respondent said no, and we're not even thinking about it, not currently considering it. Now, when we break that down by high and low performing companies, and you look at the yes, we're currently using it, almost 35% of high performing organizations said, yeah, we're using big data for learning today. So it was more than double what those low performing companies said. Now we also asked, is your organization overall effective at analyzing big data? A very small percentage said to a very high extent, yeah, we're, we're effective at that. And then another small percentage, 11% said to a high extent we're effective at that. Most people said, not really, you know, we're, we're average at it or, you know, to a small extent we're effective at analyzing big data. But again, you break that down by high and low performing companies and look how that changes. High performers are, feel that they are much better overall as an organization, this isn't just learning, uh, this, this particular one, at analyzing big data inside the company. Now when it comes to learning, it's a, a pretty similar story. Um, the, are you within the learning function effective at analyzing big data? Pretty small percentages for very high and high extent. But when you separate that by high performers and low performers, not all I did was take out the very high extent. Not a single low performing company said that they were doing this in learning, and, you know, that they were effective at analyzing big data for the learning function, which I thought was fascinating. Not a lot of high performing companies are saying it either. It's only 18% but still a lot more than those low performing companies. Now we also asked them, why are you looking at big data? And the biggest response was to better evaluate the effectiveness of L&D initiatives. Next was desire to improve our learning delivery, to better evaluate the impact of learning and development on the business results, and the need for better decision making within the learning function. There were a bunch of other answers, but these were the top four that I pulled out of, uh, out of the, the study. So let me ask a question. Out of this audience, which knows big data and knows analytics and knows many of you know learning very well, does this resonate with you? Is this why you're looking at big data and learning? Which one in particular? The third one? So better evaluating the impact on the business results. How many of you are doing that? How many of you are, are primarily looking at big data to see how it impacts the business results? Okay, got a few hands. I mean, that's, that's the holy grail, right? That's what we're all trying to do, is trying to make sure that we understand, is there any bottom line business impact to our learning initiatives? Now, we also asked about technology to help do that. And uh, Kent will like this um, particular slide. Uh, Jeff, you'll, Jeffrey, you'll like this too. Uh, we asked, are you building or buying? And low performers were more apt to say that they were meeting their needs internally um, from an analytics technology perspective. High performing companies were much, much more apt to say, uh, we are purchasing. While we're meeting some of the needs internally, we're purchasing technology to help us better understand this. Now we also asked, do you have a person overseeing learning big data? And high performers were more apt to say yes, they have that. How many of you have an individual that's responsible for big data in learning? Okay, so those, for those of you who raised your hand, how long has that person been in that position? Just happened, okay. Four months. Anybody longer than four months? 
Yeah, how, how much longer? One year. I, um, I was at one of our member companies a little while ago. I met this uh, relatively uh, young woman who had been hired to do analytics uh, for learning. And uh, when her boss left the room, I said to her, you are going to have a hell of a career. And it might not be here. <laughs> you are going to be in great, great demand. Uh, because she understood, she got it. She, was, uh, she really understood learning, but she was a statistical wizard. And that's a skill set that we're just not seeing a whole lot of. So it'll be interesting as we go, you know, as we continue down this path, where are you getting these people from and how they're working out. Um, but my recommendation to all of you that raised your hand, treat those individuals like high potentials in your organization. Make sure that you're, you know, moving them in the organization. Make sure they're getting, uh, you know, a lot of attention because they're going to be a great demand going forward. Um, we also ask from a data analysis perspective, um, where are your data analysts organized? Is it decentralized? Is it centralized? And I thought this was kind of interesting that high performers are more apt to say we're centralized in this function uh, or that we have put it in the functional areas versus being completely decentralized. And I think they're, what they're doing here is they're really leveraging their ability to look at different areas and leveraging technology most likely uh, to provide that analysis versus just keeping it all decentralized. So if you've questioned, you know, what, what is your org structure? How, you know, how should we have this from an analysis perspective? There's some good fodder. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but we asked, where is learning data shared inside your organization? And I thought this was great, too. And you can see that the gap between high and low performers on all of these is pretty large. Um, but leadership development and succession planning is a big one. Uh, with senior leaders for organizational strategic planning was another one, performance management, hypo uh, identification and development, um, sharing it with business line leaders for productivity improvements, and then for internal talent pool and internal recruiting. And look at that bottom one, how the, the wide gap on that one, and how people are using learning data inside their organization. Does this resonate with anybody? Are you using learning data for these activities? What's that? Starting to? Well, you just got your data analyst, so I understand that. Um, we also asked, to what extent does your learning staff possess the knowledge and skills required to meet the training needs of the broader organizational staff in developing analytical skills? So this is a little different. This is L&D being able to train others in the organization to have the necessary analytical skills. And a very small percentage that they can do this. This is another area where I think we're going to need a lot of work going forward, the ability for L&D to, to really educate others inside the organization. We also asked, where are you getting these people? Are you hiring them or are you training them? And you can see that hiring was actually much higher in all of these, whether it was problem solving skills, technology skills, critical thinking skills, business acumen. They're all looking at hiring from the outside versus training internally for these skill sets. And when we asked what are the best training methods that you're using, mentoring was number one, um, whether it was through with frontline workers, functional experts, managers, supervisors, or leaders. Cross-functional team-based training was number two. You had self-study, degree program, and others. So mentoring is really uh, where a lot of companies are focusing their attention on getting these skills transferred. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I've seen derail this in many organizations is data accuracy. And there's nothing worse than coming in with some great data around a particular function and then having that big bear of a C CFO uh, that we saw earlier today, uh, find holes in the data, right? Because that just throws it all out of whack. So ensuring data accuracy is a question that we've asked a few times. And how do you check for internal, con how are you doing this? And so checking for internal consistency, uh, automated processes, et cetera. When low performing companies answer this question, they're much more apt to say, we do not place any known controls for accuracy. Which reminded me of a, a Dilbert that I just loved. 
where Dilbert's up at the board. He said, I didn't have any, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made this one, made up this one. Uh, studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. <laughs> so the boss asks, how many studies showed that? 87. <laughs> so if there's a piece of advice I can leave you with, and it's, um, it's much like uh, what Tim Massa, VP of HR at Kroger here says, um, there's not a business leader that doesn't look to the CFO for help with profit, forecast, earnings count. They have the credibility, and we need to build that in HR so that the CEO is looking at the HR lead for that same kind of credibility, that same kind of data. But if you don't have it, be confident about it. So just like that Dilbert <laughs> uh, cartoon, I think it does rely around confidence. You have to have confidence in what you're presenting, confidence in the data. And even if you're not 100% confident, you know, you've, you've got to act like you, uh, you are confident. And I've, ed I've educated many a, a learning person around this notion that when they go in and talk to uh, the business about the impact a learning program had on the business, I often get this question in conferences. Well, what about the economy? And there's all kinds of things that you know, had other impact. Take credit for it. If you have a learning program that clearly has correlation to a business impact, take credit for it. Don't make excuses around the economy had something to do with it or other factors in the company had something to do with it. It's all about having the confidence and the credibility.